Camp. Um, I am a retired certified quilt appraiser with the American Quilt Society. I've studied quilts for probably 40 years and in 2003 I became a certified appraiser. Um, I retired in 2018 but the knowledge is still here in my head. Um, I love the study of old quilts and fabric and textiles and I was thrilled that the Bartholomew County Historical Society invited me to come and share my knowledge about their quilts. Quilts have been around for many centuries. In the United States, quilts were made first out of necessity, also out of the love of beauty and the love of handwork and needlework, which all the young women were taught from a very young age. Red and green quilts were very popular in the early to mid 1800s. Red and greens were permanent fabric colors, so they were used extensively in the quilt world and by quilt makers. Accent color of this cheddar was also quite popular. Red and green quilts, many of them were made from specific patterns, as is this one, which is a star set inside a square and accented by the feathered um, leaves and extensions which make the whole thing appear to be a feathered star. This one has rather extensive quilting. We call this a feathered design. And she's accented her plain block with little tiny circles which are um, a hand worker's nightmare sometimes to get them to be perfectly circular. This one has been done beautifully probably made around 1860. These color combinations were popular from about 1830 and still remain popular today. But the highlight of that color and that type of quilt was from around the 1860s to the 1870s or 80s. This particular one was made by Martha Brumfield, circa 1860. She used all cotton fabrics which were available. Um, it has a cotton batting on the inside and a feed sack type backing on the outside. Martha and her husband Samuel lived in Nortonburg in Flat Rock Ta Township here in Bartholomew County. The next red and green is my favorite one in the display. From around 1840, at least up until the 1900s, although even into the next century many people still used the red and greens because it was such a striking color combination. So you'll see some of these reproduced and newly made in the, up until the 1930s. This one is probably around 1860 to 1870. It does have a little bit of light um, color fading. This happens when the green is made starting with blue and yellow added on top or yellow and then blue added on top to create the green and as it fades it changes colors. This happens with light. That is probably the quilt's biggest um, threat is to damage by light. This one I particularly love because it doesn't really have a, a common pattern. It's called a four block because each of the four quadrants are similar, not exact, exactly the same. This may have been made by more than one person, but we don't know that because we don't know who made this quilt. But technically, it was a challenge for whoever did it. The flower centers with red and the cheddar again as accent 
Some of it is appliqued, some of it is reverse appliqued, which is also very common. What's fun about this quilt is that the leaves, although she may have had a template or a pattern, the leaves vary. Every leaf appears to be somewhat different from other leaves, even in each quadrant. So it may have been made by four different people or several different people, or by one who wasn't particularly um, careful with how she outlined and appliqued her leaves. But that gives it a real quirky look, which I dearly love. I also enjoy her center um, strip or vine that she's included that crosses in the center and comes back in each quadrant. But none of those four quadrants match. They're all different. The other thing I noticed as I examined this quilt carefully was that each of the four corners are different. None of the corners match each other. So it, it just made for a fun quilt to examine. The other thing that I noticed as we did it um, were these little um, buds and circles are all also different. The stem is different size on each one. This one being long, this one being very short. Some had seven or eight circles, some had only five or six. So there was no consistency to how it was put together. The binding is pretty typical of a quilt from this age. Um, a very narrow binding, um, less than a quarter inch, which is quite common. The quilt designs were very well applied. You can see she has a feathered circle and also a feathered design. We looked for initials, often on one of these style quilts. Um, the worker will um, quilt her initials or a date. We didn't find that, we wish we could have. Uh, that would be a clue to its age and maybe even to its maker. So if you own one of these red and greens, examine every corner carefully and look for initials or dates because it very well could be there. This one is not in what we would call excellent shape. It's more in an average to poor shape. Um, it did require a little bit of hand applique repair, which if you look carefully, you can find in this block um, we've added a little bit of red over um, some torn places, a little bit of cheddar in this flower, and then in some white areas where there was actually a hole, it has been repaired. Um, you would normally, if you repair an old quilt like this, put a label on it that says, this quilt was repaired in 2021 by whomever did that work. Um, but this is definitely my favorite quilt of the collection because I have a soft spot for red and green quilts. The next quilt is a log cabin. This one um, is called Barn Raising. Log cabins were quite popular in the late 1860s and they are still popular today. This one is quite tedious. The squares are very small. Normally you would start with a small square in the center and then build the rows around that block. This one is a folded technique um, where it is stitched to a foundation and then the piece is added on each side as you go round and round. What makes this one special, made by Sarah Cox Glick, was that she used pieces of her wedding gown Wedding gowns were not necessarily white in this time frame. Hers was this beautiful shimmering gray. And she wore this in 1875 when she married Solomon Glick, a um, popular and well-known family from Bartholomew County. When you stand back from it, you can see the barn raising design as she's worked with a light center, then a dark row, a light, and dark, creating the barn raising effect. The next quilt is a hexagon quilt, all done by hand using silk fabrics that were provided by the granddaughter's party dresses in the late 19th century. This one was made by Anna Rosina Holland Thrapp. 
probably made about 1890. Each of these tiny hexagons were hand pieced, needle and thread, um, no electricity most likely, no electricity at all, I'm sure, by candlelight or evening light or gas light perhaps. These are very tedious quilts to make, kept people busy <laughs> with their hands. This one also has some velvet pieces in it and many silks. When silks were used in this time frame, silk fabric will disintegrate. There is really nothing you can do to prevent that disintegration. It just happens over time. And that is probably because when silk is processed, um, the chemical and the, the processing itself causes the fabric to deteriorate. These can be repaired. It's very tedious work. You would find a piece of silk, um, either an aged piece or a newer piece, and you would hand applique over the parts that are shredding. And that is very typical of this style of quilt. Also, a way to preserve this kind of quilt is to use a product um, we call crepeline or a very fine bridal illusion and you can hand applique a piece of that fabric over the disintegrating piece of silk and that will prevent it from um, shredding away any worse than it has already. This one's very beautiful. Young ladies were often taught needlework and household skills at seminaries and other Christian um, places. This particular Ocean Waves quilt was made around 1900 by Tilly Lush and Mary Bullrichter. Um, it was attributed to Tilly, and it's most likely made by Tilly's mother, Mary. Uh, they lived in Clay Township in Bartholomew County. Ocean Waves is a very popular pattern. It's been around for many, many, many years. In the 1900s, this was a tedious pattern because each of these little triangles would have been cut out by hand and then pieced together to make the area that we call the ocean and the waves around the ocean. We date this partially because of the fabric. This is a conversation print or a shirting print popular from around 1880 up until about 1910. And the little checked fabric also is well documented from the 1880s up until around 1910 or 1920. This is a beautiful example of very tedious hand piecing, very well quilted in a very tiny quilting pattern. And the lines of the quilting are less than a half inch apart, so it's very densely quilted and very nicely done. Quilting has been an everlasting um, hobby and pastime for many, many generations. I told you earlier that quilts up until around 1920 were dark, um, using fabrics in the dark browns, dark navies, dark uh, claret reds. Around 1920, the colors began to lighten up in the quilts that we see. And this is an example of a quilt made around the early 1930s when the colors began to be brighter, there were a lot of florals involved and away from the darkness of the earlier quilts. Um, many patterns were published in newspapers and in magazines, which also helped to spread a resurgence of quilting among the, um, among the, the ladies. You could buy a newspaper and it would have a free pattern in it. And the next week on Sunday or whenever, you would get the next pattern. Um, you would think that the newspaper publishers liked the ladies by publishing the patterns, but actually they liked selling newspapers. And this was a way to increase their circulation. So it was very common and very popular. One of the designers was Ruby Short McKim, and she published 27, I believe, different series of quilt patterns that are published in newspapers. And many of us are collectors of those. If you can find old newspapers, you can find her patterns yet in the old clippings. This particular quilt is called the Garden Block Quilt, and it was designed by Florence Leganke. 
Um, and she published the, this series in, in newspapers all over the country. We actually had a copy of the papers from Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, the whole set, and there's one shown here as to what it looked like. The ladies would then trace this with old-fashioned carbon paper and make their own templates and then create the quilt. This particular quilt was made by Ethel Littrell um, around 1934, and she came to Columbus from Michigan, and her father was a circuit preacher with the Disciples of Christ Church, and while they were waiting for their furniture to arrive here in Bartholomew County, they stayed at the Ir Irwin family home, and to keep Ethel busy, her mother gave her um, sewing projects, which included embroidery, smocking, crocheting, and of course, quilting. Ethel was the quilter. She finished this quilt in 1934. She sent it to L.S. Ayers Department Store in Indianapolis where they had an annual quilt contest and she won first place at the Indianapolis Star. Um, so this is, a, this is a real treasure for the Bartholomew County Historical Society. You can see that it does have some age. There are creasing lines where it's been folded. Um, some of the things you can do to preserve an older quilt is not to fold it, first of all, or if you must fold it and put it away, fold it in different ways on a regular basis. Several times a year, take them out and refold them so you don't create that, that line. It does have some faded spots, maybe from some moisture or a spill of some kind. I don't recommend that you try to wash them. Just leave it as is and you'll do less damage to the quilt than if you try to wash it and clean it up. Um, this one is really a fun pattern that she used. They called it the Nancy Page Quilt Club in the newspaper. Uh, Nancy Page was their pseudonym for um, the quilt club itself. Nancy Page did not exist. She was like Betty Crocker. She was their name, but Florence Legenke actually did the design. Um, the birds are called Meek and Saucy, and each block, each month, or each week has a different flower using the same um, vase as the, as the basis. This one is densely quilted. Again, the designs of the quilt, quilting are less than a half inch apart. Beautifully, beautifully done. Her border is exquisitely put together. You can see there is some fading of the greens. Um, the greens of that era were not as stable as some of the greens of other times. But a beautiful, beautiful little quilt from the 1930s. This quilt was uh, made by Lydia Newsom Lambert. It's called a crazy quilt. Um, the popular time frame for this style of quilt was in the 1880s through 1910. This one's documented around 1890. This was donated by Lydia in 1931. A crazy quilt is made um, from scraps of fabric that were probably used in garments, also used in household furnishings such as bedspreads or draperies or slip covers. The style was to embroider on them. The more embroidery that you have on them, the fancier the crazy quilt and the more popular and the more valuable. This one is one where she really did um, overdo herself and really worked hard. Another technique they used on them was painting on the silk part of the fabrics and I think there was some in this, if I can find it. Yes, right here. This flower has actually been painted on. This one is a combination of both painting and embroidery. Again, in the late 1800s, 18, or 1900s, the needlework was the fashion. Um, so these ladies practice all the different styles and designs of needlework that they could imagine. And again, the more fancy it was, the more, um, the more it was accepted. This one actually has one little piece, I think, that's been replaced. 
and it has some hand um, applique pieces that have been attached. The little flowers have been attached later. But crazy quilts were quite the fashion. This one was made probably in separate strips. You can see where they might have been connected through here and through here. So this might be called actually a nine block crazy quilt where each block was made and then when she put it together she overlapped some of the designs to hide the seams. And she finished it with velvet which was very popular and useful in that time frame. Um, the pieces are usually different, um, different sizes and shapes and of course they've added buttons, beads, ribbons, lace and embroidery and supposedly these were also came into fashion after the death of um, Queen Victoria's husband, Albert. And the dark colors were also popular in that time frame. Um, most of the quilts from that generation would be darker colors up until about 1920 when things began to lighten up. So this is a beautiful example circa 1890 of a crazy quilt. Signature quilts also had their vogue um, in the late 1800s and up through the 1900s and even today. Signature quilts are very popular. We often make them in honor of somebody, somebody special, perhaps a teacher, a preacher, or a pastor who's moving to a different area. We don't always know what the reason behind the signature quilts are, Many of them were used as fundraisers. If you paid a dime or a quarter, you could ha have your name embroidered or placed on a quilt. This one was most likely embroidered by the same person because all of the signatures have the same style of handwork. This one is on polished cotton with the fancy ruffle around the edge and the beautiful hemmed um, embroidery stitch on the hemming. We don't know the reason that this particular quilt was made. It is a mystery, but it, all of the names are from Bartholomew County. It could have been from a church or a women's organization or even a men's organization. And very likely it could have been a fundraiser and it would have done quite well. When you come to notice it, each of the blocks has a, an embroidered flower. Maybe it was even a garden club. We don't really know who designed it or what its purpose was, but it's held up beautifully. This one, probably around 1900. This is one of the oldest quilts in the Bartholomew County Historical Society's collection, and we know that because it actually has the date embroidered, March 28, 1846. We don't really know, again, what the purpose of this quilt was, it has flowers embroidered in the middle in red thread. The red embroidery thread was, ve was very useful because it was color fast and didn't fade. So it was used a lot in quilts in the late 1800s up through today. We still use it. It has many names from the Bartholomew County area. Again, we don't know what the purpose of this one was. It might have been, like I said, for a teacher or a pastor or a family friend. Um, many, many names on it. I see Everode, which we know. It is very worn. Some of the surface is at, some of the surface threads have actually disintegrated or worn away. But a beautiful example of the um, signature type quilt. And this one, each block was most likely made by different people because the um, the stitch style and lettering style are different on each of the blocks. And the last one we have is a membership quilt. Again, this was part of Bartholomew County's Historical Society's 60th anniversary observance, and it was a fundraising project. Members purchased a space on this quilt. Blocks um, with the initials in the center are family blocks pur purchased by the Crumps, the Joneses, the Leonards, the Mars, the Millers, the Newton Stevensons, the Reeves, and the Schott families. Um, other blocks contain various names 
um, of other people who participated. And it was a community effort. Members of the White River chapter of the Embroiders Guild of America took on the needlework as a summer project in 1981. Uh, we want to thank you for coming and watching our quilt exhibit here at the Bartholomew County Historical Society. We invite you to come yourself and see these quilts firsthand and live. Um, and we hope that you enjoy this display that was beautifully put together. Mm -hmm.